morning, everybody. So the, the distribution of there we go. I'm sorry for real. Um, the distribution of fitness effects uh, refers to the proportion of new mutations that have a particular effect on fitness. So you can see here is one hypothetical distribution of fitness effects where there are many strongly deleterious mutations, many neutral mutations, and few that are in the middle. And the distribution of fitness effects is really a key quantity in population genetics because it determines how, essentially, how evolution works and what happens to genetic uh, variants and mutations once they arise in the population. So there's been a lot of interest in trying to characterize this distribution using various experimental and, and analytical approaches across different um, species. And so in my talk today, I'm going to tell you about our work on looking at the biological factors that can determine the distribution of fitness effects, or the, uh, DFD. So this is, of course, not, not, a, uh, not a new question. There's actually been a fair number of theoretical models that have been put forth over the years to make predictions about what the distribution of fitness effects would look like, assuming certain biological factors may be important for its evolution. And so what I'm going to do now is introduce some of these different uh, models to you and sort of explain the key uh, concepts um, behind them. And so to, to illustrate this, I'm, I think it's, it's most clearly illustrated by looking at sort of two different examples of different, different species, let's say. And so let's consider one species that maybe has higher organismal complexity and small population size. Now, obviously, complexity can be quite, quite hard to define, um, and that's a whole separate uh, discussion that we could have, but certainly there's, we could think about numbers of protein-protein interactions or, or network architecture or, some, or something of that sort. Or more theoretically, we could think about the number of phenotypes potentially under selection. So we can think about one species that has high complexity uh, and then contrast that with a species that has lower complexity and, and perhaps larger po uh, population size. So the first model, and what I think would probably be the most naive model, would be essentially what I'm considering the functional importance model. So the idea here is that uh, mutations affect on fitness will depend, you know, is the particular protein that it occurs in, is that related to fitness or not? And, uh, and assuming that things are generally constant over time, that would predict that the distribution of uh, fitness effects would be similar across species. A second model that I'm calling the protein uh, folding model, that, that's been put forth and, and suggests that it's not actually the proteins themselves that are that important for fitness, but more the idea of having stable proteins. And that's where selection is really acting because you want to have uh, thermodynamically stable proteins. And it turns out this model makes the interesting prediction that the distribution of NS ought to be the same between species. And this is essentially a model of epistasis where the, the basic idea here is that in the large uh, species with large population size, right? By definition, n is going to be be quite large, but that means selection will be very efficient, and therefore, protein really stable proteins can be made. Then, when subsequent deleterious mutations occur, well, they're occurring on these stable proteins, so they're less they're less likely to have a big impact. So, in other words, n would be large, and s would be would be small. And that contrasts with the species that has smaller population size, where of course n is smaller, but now when new mutations occur in these less stable proteins, they're going to have a bigger effect on fitness. And so essentially, under general under some conditions, these two uh, factors uh, would cancel. A third model, or a class of models, refers to mutational robustness models. And these would make the prediction that in the more complex species you have, more uh, redundancy in pathways, more ways to compensate or buffer the effects of deleterious mutations. So in that situation, the average selection coefficient ought to be less deleterious than in the um, uh, species that's less complex. And lastly, there's a class of models from Fisher's geometric model that essentially makes a number of different predictions, some of which uh, in include that essentially the opposite prediction, that the average selection coefficient would be more deleterious in the um, in more complex species. And the intuition there is that you have more phenotypes under selection, so a selection coefficient or a mutation is more likely to disrupt something um, important. There's also predictions about positive selection and, all, uh, and the proportions of beneficial mutations, and I'll talk more about that after. So all of these models have some theoretical basis and some experimental support in, in different systems, but there hasn't been a systematic comparison of these models against each other, considering genetic variation data from natural populations across a phylogenetically diverse set of, um, of taxa. And the important uh, thing to realize is that all of, these, all of these models make different predictions about how the distribution of fitness effects ought to vary across different species. So this is the work that, that we did. Uh, this was led by Christian Huber, a uh, postdoc in, in my group. And what we did was we looked at genetic variation data from natural populations, initially starting focusing on humans and, and uh, Drosophila melanogaster, 
focusing on non-synonymous uh, mutations there. And from these data, we, we could estimate uh, the distribution of um, fitness effects. So briefly, the approach that we took was to use the site frequency spectrum, which I'm showing up at the top here. And the idea is the frequency spectrum is very sensitive to selection and demography. And so as you move from left to right, the mutations become more and more deleterious. And you see there's fewer of them segregating. And those that are segregating are, of course, rare. Now, there's some challenges to using the frequency spectrum for, for inference here, um, namely that demography also affects the frequency spectrum, as, as we all know. So the approach that we've taken and that was used by others is to use uh, synonymous sites to first estimate the demographic histories of the different populations, and then conditional on those demographic parameter estimates, estimate a um, distribution of fitness effects. So essentially, we've extended the Poisson random uh, field approach to be considering multiple species jointly, and then in a likelihood ratio test framework that I'll tell you about in a second, to test for whether the parameters of the distribution of fitness effects differ across species. And I want to emphasize again, each species is allowed to have its own uh, demographic history that's fit to the polymorphism data. So the, the inferences I'll be telling you about shouldn't be compounded by demography. So first, we, we applied this approach to polymorphism data from uh, Drosophila from Africa, as well as uh, human populations, and inferred the distribution of fitness effects. And so here I'm showing the likelihood surface for a gamma, for the parameters of a gamma distribution uh, of, of fitness effects, and the, the parameter estimates are shown in the table here. We then uh, inferred the distribution of fitness effects for, for Drosophila. Again, the likelihood surface is shown here. And then we fit a uh, constrained model where we essentially constrain the parameters to be the same between species and then re-optimize the likelihood function. And what you can see here is that the log likelihood of the, um, of the restricted model is substantially worse than that of the model where each species is allowed to have its own distribution of fitness effects. And this is significant with the likelihood ratio test. And we've done a, a fair bit of simulations to get the proper null distribution for this likelihood ratio test statistic. And it's uh, clearly significant even in those results, or those simulations. So why, how do the VFEs differ? Well, it turns out humans, shown in blue here, have a higher proportion of uh, more strongly deleterious mutations compared to uh, Drosophila, shown in red. So we can reject the essentially naive functional importance model that predicts the distribution of fitness effects ought to be the same between species. When we turn to the protein folding model, we can essentially apply our same likelihood ratio test framework, but now test whether the distribution of NS differs across species. And when we do that, we again find the restricted model has a substantially worse log likelihood as compared to the full model. And here, NS is larger in, uh, inferred to be larger in Drosophila uh, as compared to humans. So that rejects the model where NS is the same across species. If we look at the mutational robustness model, that predicts the average selection coefficient ought to be less deleterious in the uh, more, um, more complex species. And in fact, the results I just showed you, in fact, went in the opposite direction where the average selection coefficient was actually more deleterious in the um, more complex um, species. So that leaves us with Fisher's geometric model. Now, Fisher's geometric model is a, a conceptual uh, model where there's an optimal uh, 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 fitness, and then the population exists somewhere in, in, this, in this space, and mutations will move the population uh, around in this space. There's been a fair bit of theory that's been done over the years on this model, and some of the key parameters in it are the uh, complexity or number of phenotypes under selection, as well as the pleiotropy of um, different mutations, or the, the number of phenotypes that a given mutation affects. So Fisher's geometric model makes a number of predictions we can actually directly test with, with our data. The first is that more complex organisms ought to have more deleterious mutations than less complex organisms. And we have some evidence of this from the human uh, Drosophila comparison, but we wanted to expand and consider other other species. And so what we did was we uh, applied our same inference framework to natural populations of yeast as well as mice. And uh, what I'm showing you here is the average selection coefficient that we infer for these different species. And so you clearly see as we move from yeast to humans that the uh, average non-synonymous mutation becomes more deleterious. And that holds true whether we assume a gamma distribution of fitness effects shown in orange or whether we actually fit the full Fisher's geometric model from the theory derived by uh, Lorenko et al. So in other words, that prediction of Fisher's geometric model is indeed satisfied. A second prediction has to do with pleiotropy, and that is that less pleiotropic mutations ought to have a more strongly skewed distribution of fitness effects. The intuition here is, right, for less pleiotropic mutations, that means they only affect a small number of phenotypes. And so depending on how, whether or not that phenotype is related to fitness, you might see very many neutral mutations as well as many strongly deleterious mutations, thus creating a more skewed distribution of fitness effects. 
whereas more pleiotropic mutations are essentially averaging over more phenotypes, and so the distribution will tend to be less skewed. So of course, measuring pleiotropy in, in a sort of systematic way is, is quite difficult, and so what we did was we turned to looking at gene expression breadth as a proxy for um, pleiotropy. And the, the key uh, idea here was that we assumed that genes that have a tissue-specific pattern of expression are less pleiotropic than those that have a more broadly expressed pattern. So we classified genes based on expression, and then we estimated the distribution of fitness effects for these um, different categories. And so here are the results. Let me walk you through this plot here. Um, each of the two rows shows the different species. The different columns refer to overall uh, expression levels. And then what I'm showing you here is the estimate of the shape parameter of the gamma distribution, which is directly related to how skewed the distribution is. And so the key idea is that a lower um, shape parameter means a more skewed uh, distribution. And so what we find is that the tissue-specific genes, or those that we think are less polytropic, do indeed have a lower shape parameter indicating a more skewed distribution of fitness effects. And so that's, again, consistent with the prediction from Fisher's geometric model. The last prediction is that species with small population size ought to have more of a, a higher proportion of beneficial mutations. And the logic for that goes something like this. In the small population size, that allows you can have a fixation of uh, weakly uh, deleterious mutations that will move the population then further from the optimum, essentially this drift load that, that accumulates. And that then creates an opportunity for subsequent beneficial mutations to arise. So we could again leverage the theory developed, uh, derived in Marenko et al. to actually estimate the population sizes that would be consistent with the amount of drift load seen in each of the uh, two populations. So this is importantly not estimates of effective population size from genetic variation data like we normally would do, but rather the amount of uh, essentially uh, any related to the amount of drift load in the different populations. And so what we find is, in fact, that the estimates we get for humans and Drosophila are at least within the order of magnitude as it's similar to what we would see from uh, patterns of genetic variation in more modern uh, populations, suggesting, in fact, that, um, that indeed that this, this prediction is, is supported. Another interesting thing that I'd be happy to chat more about after is if we actually look at the proportions of beneficial mutations, we find there are more weakly beneficial mut uh, non-synonymous uh, mutations that have arisen in the human population as compared to Drosophila to essentially compensate for this uh, uh, deviation from the optimum due to uh, drip load. So in conclusion, the naive assumption that the distribution of, of selection coefficients is constant across species doesn't hold. Selection coefficients on average are more deleterious in more complex organisms. We see a stronger skew in the DFD for genes that are less polyotropic or have a tissue-specific expression pattern. Overall, Fisher's geometric model is, is consistent with a lot of these predictions, and that suggests complexity and population size are sort of key features for determining the DFD. And that's not to say, however, that features of other models aren't, aren't, aren't valid or don't work, or that they don't uh, capture the uh, distribution of fitness effects uh, differing across phylogenetically um, diverse taxa. So I'd like to thank the folks in my uh, group who worked on this, as well as my funding sources. If you want to read more of the technical details, this was recently was published. You can check it out there. And last but not least, I'm looking for, for postdocs. So if you or anyone you know um, wants to work on these sorts of things, uh, shoot me an email. I'll be here the rest of the, uh, the day and, uh, and tomorrow. Um, so I'd be happy to chat about that. And here's a picture, a recent picture from our, our lab meeting. Um, so come to UCLA. It's a, it's a fun place. Thanks. on the demographic inference on the synonymous sites, we essentially account for that. So I'm not worried about that confounding the results. Yeah, but I think about your uh, you know, difference about the fraction that the communications that you're asking about here. Let's chat after.